I'd like to start by asking you to read about those poems. First of all, the George Hadley, a very famous poem. I suppose I must have read it first when I was uh, when I was at school when we were studying George Herbert, and I can't remember ever consciously learning it, mm. but I read it so many times over that it, it went in and stayed, mm. and still does. And for me, is I suppose about as near as you get to the essence of what I believe about faith. Mm. Um, mm. The mixture of absolute homeliness of language. Mm. This is a scene in a kitchen or in a pub. The monosyllables, I did sit and eat. You know, it's absolutely bare in a way. And yet something immense is going on in it. Simone Weil, the great French philosopher, learned it by heart when she was a young woman and she speaks about her experience of reciting it um, when she was staying at a monastery and feeling that Christ had come in and made himself at home as she said the words, mm. Mm. sitting and eating. So yes, it's something I keep going back to. And um, if I had five pounds for every time I've quoted it in a sermon, I'd be a very rich man. Yeah, it's again, um, <clears throat> where did I think, once again, when I was at school, not that we were studying Yeats officially, but um, in the poetry textbook there were a number of people who we weren't supposed to be reading, mm. as well as the ones we were, so of course I read those. Yeah. Um, Yeats was one of them. And I suppose what struck me was that very delicate balance in that extraordinary poem between restlessness and stillness. Um, the pale, unsatisfied ones, the, the magi, the, the wise men, um, always unsatisfied, always searching. And yet, they're, they're fixed like stars in the sky. Their faces are like weather-beaten stone. Um, it's as if they're very restlessness and they're questioning has become something absolutely stable, absolutely still. And that's where the curious turnaround in the last two lines always strikes me, being by Calvary's turbulence unsatisfied, mm -hmm. still looking for the uncontrollable mystery <coughs> on the bestial floor, the bestial floor, the, you know, the ordinary animal world of our bodies, mm -hmm. which is also <coughs> where the most mysterious thing of all happens. Mm. Um, in the New Testament story, that's the coming of Christ. Yeats saw it rather differently, but mm. I, I just love that, that tightrope balance of the restlessness and the stories. Mm. Uh, and that's the relationship isn't there, between the two poems that is the sacred meeting the ordinary. The... Exactly. It's, it's something flowering from the the absolutely prosaic, absolutely every day. Mm. And, and also, I think, in both of them, the balance of restlessness and homecoming. Mm. Mm. I mean, reading your poem, one of the other um, influences I wondered about was whether, whether you're influenced by uh, Geoffrey Hill. Ah, um, yes, well, yeah. uh, You've written yeah. about Geoffrey Hill, uh, uh, one yes, of the essays about yes. Hill. Um, Yes, I suppose, I suppose that's right. I mean, Geoffrey is one of the people I must admire among living poets, mm. um, though he gets <coughs> more and more brutally difficult. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's not easy, it? It's not easy, it does But I suppose I, I was very taken with his um, Tenebrae collection mm. in the mm. late 70s, mm. and the sonnets there especially the lacrimae sonnets. Mm. Um, something about his sensibility or imagination certainly rings bells. Uh, influence, I, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. I, you must find the same, that it's always rather difficult to talk about influence. Yes, yeah, you're influenced by everybody, in the sense. Influenced by everybody, yes. yes. But there's a sense of a, a strictness in your work that reminded me of time. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you find that. Um, 
because I, I would hope there's a strictness there. Mm. I do sometimes think, is that lazy? Mm. <laughs> but I, I can't resist the story of um, R.S. Thomas, um, another you know, star of the sky. Mm. <laughs> a fellow well, Welshman. A fellow Welshman, a fellow priest. Mm. When he was asked at a, a reading um, about his influences, and there was a long, long pause. And R.S. did pauses like nobody else. <laughs> and the temperature dropped. <laughs> After a while, the chair said, uh, Mr. Thomas, I, there was none at the back who asked about influences. And there was another long Arctic pause. And R.S. said, surely not. <laughs> so I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> so let's move briskly on. <laughs> Um, as I was saying to you just when we were talking just now, I wanted to sort of look at your life and work and faith through, through the lens of poetry. I wanted to start with your wonderful secret, Graves and Gates, uh, in the poetry of uh, Rowan Williams. Um, of course, I, I couldn't help but be struck that they're in, in the centre of them, pretty much, is the, is the two um, elegies to your parents. I wonder whether you could sort of introduce us to your parents. I think your, your mother was a, a Welsh... Farmer or mine, I can't quite remember. Um, both parents were Welsh. My mother came from a shopkeeping and farming family, my father from a mining family. Mm. Um, my mother had polio as a child, and that meant that throughout her life she moved very painfully and I think lived with just perpetual discomfort. Mm. And that mm. was that's one of many things that would make her life very easy. Mm. Um, my father, I think, had avoided going down the mine by going to the RAF and war mm. and getting an engineer's training. And he was a very, very, very self-contained person. Mm. Mm. And they died within just over two weeks of each other. Mm. And it seemed around that time quite a lot of people I knew were dying, mm. which is why there's a number of poems mm. about death there. Mm. And yes, those two elegies, as you say, are, in a sense, Heart. That's how they felt in, in, in that sequence. But th those energies open out to energies for Nietzsche, for R Rilke, for Tolstoy. Wonderful. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> 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 um, a wonderful poem uh, on R.S. Thomas. Uh, oh, complete yes. finishes with a wonderful poem about Thomas. Um, I mean, the, of course, one of the things that's striking reading, reading your collections is how voraciously well read you are. Did you, know, did you have a sort of bookish, were you born with a book? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. Um, I'm told I got it partly from my mother's father, who <coughs> my used to say, if left by himself, would, would read the text on a packet of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> but it, again, it had something to do with, with being rather ill as a child, mm. and being in bed a lot, and just yes, reading mm. omnivorously. Mm. Mm. <coughs> it's striking that. I mean, there's a lot in, you know, in the poems generally, but obviously I noticed it in the poems of, of um, the first collection. There is a lot of death you know, in, the, in the poems generally. Um, it reminded me of um, somebody interviewing Seamus Heaney, and someone saying this question to him, there was a lot of death in your poems. And Heaney sort of paused and then said, uh, remind me what else there is to write about. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, do you feel the same? Yes. <laughs> Um, if there's such a thing as a universal agenda, mm. that's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can't remember who came up with this, but the sort of philosophical question, how would you recognize a human being as a human being? If you, if you met some um, utterly, utterly strange, externally strange being, how might you recognize them as human and personal or something? Mm. And one part of the answer would be if they talked about death. Mm. Then you'd have something to talk about. Mm. Mm. And so I think there is a, a sense in which that's, that's built in. And built in, therefore, to any imaginative enterprise, imagination has to cope with death. Mm. And it, it's as if your imagination coping with death is also imagining you know, people like Wilke, who you translated, mm. um, who seem to take you into history as well as mm. the space. Um, yes, yes. As a, as a point of empathy? Something like that. Um, something like that. I, I think that 
recovering, reworking, in some sense, how people think and imagine, how other people think and imagine <laughs> new spaces in yourself. And that's why we don't think or imagine alone. And the idea that there's some, some sort of, oh, I don't know, um, individual genius soul locked up in a little room somewhere, producing out of his or her own interior lots of imaginative stuff. That doesn't happen like that. Mm. Imagination is a shared business. You, you work with how other people have imagined and mm. thought, and you discover that now you know more than you would otherwise know. And it's, it's T.S. Eliot's phrase. Some, somebody said, um, we know so much more than our ancestors, and Eliot said precisely, and they are what we know. <laughs> Which puts us in our place, but also accepts that we move on. And again, that's, that's an important balance. I mean, the other thing that's striking in your reading the poems and rereading the poems is um, the lack of I in them. In fact, in, it, 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 there's, a, there's a poem, Dream, very strong, mm -hmm. well, terrifying, like a nightmare, like a terrifying poem, in, in, in proper sense. Uh, it's, it's actually part of the shock of that poem is it has I in it. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know. I wonder, what, is, is that a conscious thing that you... <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, I, I suppose that I'm reacting a bit against... Um, confessional poetry of a certain kind. Mm. Just as when I was first ordained as a priest, I remember making a, making a vow not to use the word I in sermons mm. for at least a couple of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Quite <laughs> so important. Important. <laughs> it's a discipline that I think is, is quite important because so much, back to what he was saying in introducing me, so much comes back to this busy, panicky, um, slightly feverish thing that pretends to be myself. Um, and from time to time, you, know, you need to say, sit. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose writing poetry, that, that for me is part of what's happening. Um, Yes. I mean, I was striking, you know, that, you know, you, you wouldn't go to the poems for, bar for your biography, you know, if, if, if someone's reading your poems, hoping to learn about, or explicitly learn at least, because you can never quite separate the biography from the work, um, but if explicitly trying to learn about you and your inner life, they wouldn't, they'd, they'd, be, they'd be trouble. <laughs> I, I suppose that's right. Yes. Um, and I don't lose too much sleep over that. Mm. I wondered, if, is, is it, because of course I'm very aware that you're, you've been so much in the public eye, and uh, I even, is there an issue there that you wouldn't? I suppose I was writing like that even before I was in, in the public eye, but mm. certainly being in the public eye doesn't encourage me to write <coughs> um, autobiographical poetry. <laughs> 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 I mean, there must. I mean, of course, it's, you know, again, reading poems, you, you can't help noticing. I mean, poetry is a particularly intimate form, I think, because it so much takes place in your mind. Um, for me, re it's the reading of the poem that is so important. It's, it's a mind thing. So um, I want, you know, I couldn't help wondering, and it's perhaps unfair on you because, you know, it's because one knows your. In the Archbishop for ten years, you've been a very public figure, and um, I just wondered how it was, how it is for you, the sort of intimate privacy, in a way, you know, slightly inverted commas, of writing poetry, and then this very public life where people will jump on, jump is perhaps sometimes too pejorative, but not always, on, on what you might say. Jumps <laughs> there. Yes, I again. Before I became an Archbishop, poetry was just one of the things I did. Mm. And I felt a bit rebelliously that I, you know, I damned if I was going to stop writing poetry just because I was Archbishop, so mm. to speak, yeah. and would see what happened. Mm. Um, and to me, it went on being a very important part of that bit of myself that wasn't taken up with role and function. Mm. 
and so all the more life-giving. Yeah. 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 <coughs> a release, do you think, to some degree? Oh, to some degree, yes. Mm. yes. Mm. But then, as I've sometimes said about writing poetry, you don't, you don't really entirely decide to do it, do you? No, no. Um, it's things, like decide to do you, do not decide to do you, yes. They, um, they hover and they land and sometimes they, they settle and sometimes they fly off. Mm -hmm. um, and to me one of the most interesting experiences of writing is, is when they do land and settle in ways which seem to have very little to do with, with the planning that you put into it. Mm -hmm. So the, the image I have sometimes used is some poems walk in and sit down mm -hmm. without preface or invitation. And there are one or two poems I can think of, well, more than one or two, where I've been astonished at the sense of just copying down what's there almost. Mm -hmm. um, things have just unfolded. And I don't mean that in any kind of um, eerie way, mm -hmm. you know, automatic writing, mm -hmm. just that something comes as this, yes, mm -hmm. this, this has to be written down. Mm. It reminds me a little bit of Rilke writing the sonnets, and he was uh, oh, okay. experienced a sublime dictation. Yes, yes, uh, that's right. Um, which of course does make them difficult. Mm. Yeah, but um, I think that it's it's one part of writing, um, but only one part. Yes, yeah, so because there's the other dimension, which again you know as much about as I do, if not more, um, which is a couple of phrases or a couple of images which obstinately hang around but you can't quite yet feel where they're going mm. and it can take ages for them to, to come together. Mm. Mm. Um, and actually in, in the um, first collection, the sonnet sequence, mm. um, seven sonnets I think, um, six of them were written in about six months, and then it's over ten years before the seventh came. <laughs> <laughs> because I knew they weren't finished. It was really uh, frustrating. Uh, I uh, felt that you know, they, they were too bad. They mm. they they stand, mm. but they weren't finished. Mm -hmm. I could not work out what was still to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, the other thing about your poems is that there is this sort of private inner speech in them. But again, rather in, not impersonal. They don't strike me as that, but they don't have this eye. But then at the same time, there, there is a pu public sense of them, because they're, they're very much about, um, to me, they're very much poems of compassion. Um, particularly compassion of suffering, not your own suffering, mm. or even suffering close to you in family and so on. But, you know, I'm thinking of poems like Yellow Scar, uh, this terrifying poem, Roadside Vieticum. Um, uh, the, the, and again, another terrifying poem, Felicity. Um, in, you, you even say in your, your essay, once again the question is to do with words that resist butchery. What has to be said is manic violence is not the last word. So I wonder whether you could say something about the, 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 this very strong um, empathy with persecution, with words that resist butchery. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's a big subject. Um, but it does seem to me that all art, if it's doing its job, connects us with reality. At one level of reality. That level of reality where there is profound suffering, where there's a limit, where I can't solve problems. I suppose that's why I've always been fascinated by, by tragedy as a form. Mm. Tragedy displays suffering that I can't do anything about. Mm. And so my, my eyes are turned inwards, in a sense, mm. to think how do I sit with that powerlessness without becoming hard or detached in the wrong way, mm. which is a question about compassion, I suppose, mm. in a way. And I've always thought that that is what art does. Not that, not that all art has to be about suffering. And not that all the poems I hasten to add are terrifying. That <laughs> 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 might say more about me than you. <laughs> but, but there are things that keep coming back. And I suppose when I look at um, 
things I've written and actually things I'm working on at the moment. There's a whole set of issues about the suffering and death of children, which, mm. which won't go away. Uh, uh. Um, and I, hmm. There's a poem in there called Twelfth Night, yeah. which is partly about that. Um, more recently, I was asked to write something um, to go alongside a performance of um, Messiaen's uh, keyboard sequence, the Lago Gasso, <coughs> um, 20 Visions of the Infant Jesus. Um, and the request came in just around the time when there were those photographs in the press of the child's body on the shore, my mm. body on the shore last year. And so I ended up writing 20 short pieces um, under the title Regarding the Child, mm. um, which was sort of interwoven with the Messiaen mm. um, music, and sort of picking up some of the themes of the music, or the sound of the music, um, but also just thinking through the horrors of the risk of loving a child, mm. Mm. which every parent knows. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because uh, I'm also aware that you have been situations of in a very extreme suffering in the world. Um, you know, there's a strong international scope to the poem. Um, and I'm thinking of poems like the wonderful poem Nagasaki, uh, that, that your poems about Istanbul, about Jerusalem. Um, they are very much poems of a man who, who has travelled, whether in your mind or reality, I, mean, I know it's both. But, um, there seems quite an uh, intention to have an international scope. That, 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 that there's a lot of beautiful lyrics about uh, the Welsh countryside, for instance, and you know, a love of, of your a place, but they, do, they definitely want to reach out, don't they, to history and geography. I suppose because of the work I've done has taken me to unexpected places. Mm. Um, it's felt like an invitation to, to do the thinking and the imagining somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The Nagasaki poem, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, that, that mattered a lot to me, um, visiting Nagasaki some mm -hmm. years ago, and not only visiting the epicenter of the day, mm -hmm. bomb, but being taken to the little hut where this extraordinary person <coughs> called Takashi Nagai had lived. He was um, a radiologist at the University of Nagasaki working on leukemia. And he himself was suffering from cancer. Mm -hmm. His wife was killed in the blast. He was at the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and he spent the rest of his life <coughs> examining the results in terms of radiation sickness, <coughs> radiation-linked cancers, mm -hmm. scientifically but also writing passionately about peace. Mm -hmm. And as he became more and more sick, he withdrew to a, a little room, a little hut, about 10 foot square. And when he couldn't move otherwise, he had a, a sort of apparatus which held a page above his head and he would write, lying flat on his back in bed. Mm -hmm. And I was taken round by his grandson. Mm -hmm. and. That was just an unforgettable moment of connection with all kinds of things, mm -hmm. with a very, very remarkable personality, mm -hmm. and <coughs> with a, again a depth of desolation and destruction, mm -hmm. which had somehow been held by this exceptional person, mm -hmm. who, who, with everything falling apart in his body and his relationships and his world. Mm -hmm. Everything falling apart, he held it together. Mm. I think of it on his back. Yes. <laughs> holding it together, holding up the sky. <laughs> it's interesting because the poem, despite being very frank about the, you know, the, 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 the horror, it's also very beautiful. Um, as if you, in writing it, you're trying to do well in your own way. Do that. what you can. Yeah. And the image with which it finishes 
Um, it's, like, it's, again, it's a, it's a true story. Um, Father Pedro Arunque, who later became head of the Jesuit order, was a chaplain in Hiroshima mm -hmm. at that time. And he describes his experience of saying mass in the hospital chapel a few days after mm -hmm. the bomb had fallen on Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. And turning around from the altar to say the Lord be with you. Mm -hmm. And looking at the pile of wreckage in front of him. Mm -hmm. And finding he couldn't get the words out. Mm -hmm. And that's when the image of the end is the, you know, the, the mouth of the atom bursting open mm -hmm. to destroy and the priest's mouth open. And those two darknesses facing each other. Mm -hmm. That had a particularly bad review from what I think yeah. is the most appalling book review I've had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I'm a Christmas card list. <laughs> oh, that's good. I've got so few people. Um, <laughs> You know, you say, and I think it's in one of the blurb that I don't know where, where it's from, but you say that you're a poet for whom religious things matter intensely. And it's, it's sort of an odd question to ask someone who's you know, been an archbishop for ten years. But Are you religious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I wonder, what, what do you mean by religion? It's one of those words, that people are very nervous of the word. Isn't they? Yes. Uh, actually, it's not... I want to hear it. It's not a word I like very much, mm. um, but it, it's a shortcut. It saves, it, it saves a bit of explaining at one level and then requires an awful lot at other levels. I can perhaps better express it by saying almost what I mean by secular. Yeah. <coughs> and for me, the secular vision of the world is one in which there's a, a sort of dimension missing. Yeah. Um, yeah. To be non secular approach to the world. Apologies to secularists present, I'm not trying to be rude, it's just my own use of the word. Um, to have a non-secular view of the world is to know that there's a dimension I can't contain or absorb. Um, I'm always looking at a reality that is seen by another. Um, and in the perspective of religious faith, that other is the infinite other. Um, but even just ordinarily, the sense that what I see is not opened, mm. something like that. Yeah. And the image that comes there theoretically is T.S. Eliot's um, the, the roses in the book of flowers that we look at. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the, in the edge of words, um, which I very much enjoyed, uh, uh, you argue in very, very philosophically um, for if I, if I got you right, for a world of intrinsic meaning and value. Uh, a very interesting argument about our language. Um, you talk about a hinterland of meaning that is imperfectly accessible to finite speakers. Um, I was very struck by that whole thrust in the book of that meaning and value are already there and that our language is faltering always doomed attempts, but not entirely doomed attempts, to, 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 to sort of move in that direction. That's right. I'm fascinated simply by the way in which language doesn't settle down. Um, we, we are never able to say, well, now we've had the last poem written, mm. any more than we can say, now we've had the last mathematical formula. Mm. There's always something that nudges, enlarges, um, pushes <coughs> another, another boundary. Mm. And that, to me, says something about the kind of beings we are. That we are beings who are repeatedly being pushed out of our comfort zones, who are uh, experiencing a world of <coughs> language, experience, experiencing truthfully, but not comprehensibly. And that the difficulty we experience in making sense of where we are and who we are, is a really important and positive thing. Mm. Yeah, mm. That difficulty is not, not bad for you. Mm. 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 You, you, you. In the book, you, you talk about how poetry uses language to, I think you say, that the, you say, you say a poet assumes assume that there will always be more to discover 
than what we think we can see. I'm very struck by that, that the, po the poetry is, a, is uh, an act of discovery. Yes. An act of discovery. As much an act of discovery as an act of creation. Mm. Of course you're putting something new into the world when you create a work of art. And at the same time, you're, you're uncovering what's there mm. at another level. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's why I think mm. it's, it's quite difficult to get the role of the will right in art. Mm. Mm. Um, now, art isn't just the will imposing itself on the world. Um, and yet, what you do as an artist is, is free. It's not constrained by the world. Another of those nice tightropes to mm. dance on. Mm. And in, 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 a, you know, in this ex exploration of language, sort of edging, and I thought very persuasively that there's this sense that there is a truth to be got at, mm. uh, that language isn't only language games, mm. this sort of nihilistic vision that what we've just got is just sounds in the dark, mm. uh, and that they don't really mean anything. Uh, I thought it was a very good argument to say that no, that there are, are experiences that they do mean. Um, and you, you talk about this hinterland of meaning, as I said, but then you describe it, which I like very much, active and mind-like, not representable as an agent among agents. I mean, this struck me as a very subtle conception of God. Um, God isn't something that I'm very um, versed in. Um, that's perhaps it's obvious. Um, um, but it, it, you know, even from my own church building upbringing, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very different God. Your, your, your exploration of, in a way, trying to move from our self sense and what clues we might have to there being something more than our self sense, something more that goes beyond you and I, self and world, and so on. Um, but the language is sort of hinting at that. You know, which I like, <coughs> active and mind-like, particularly, which is my experience as well, that, the, that beyond egotism is an active, mind-like, um, even compassionate, dare not say, uh, awareness. How do you, how in your life, if you, you manage to manage, uh, sort of marry that very subtle philosophical view of God with, you know, your role as an archbishop, with a much more literal and <coughs> traditional way, in a certain way, uh, image of God. I've never really found any great contradiction in that because oh. I suppose from first studying the history of theology, first exposures to the, you know, the early Greek fathers of the church, mm. quite a lot of Augustine and Aquinas, um, the one thing they are not talking about is a big bloke in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not, they're not marginal figures. These are the people who, who shape the Christian imagination. But of course, constantly, we are drawn back to ways of talking which are um, highly dualistic, mm. which are mythological. And the pity of that, I think, is you miss some of the excitement that there is in that richer picture. I've, I've been lecturing this last term on the, the history of doctrines of Christ in a way in which in the best of them, the Middle Ages, there's a very um, carefully worked out way of approaching the phrase of the Queen, he came down from heaven. Mm. Um, where everybody is, is concerned to say, look, don't think there's a chap up there who turns into a chap down here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here is a moment in the world's history where that personal, mind-like infinity of energy is focused mm. in unique fullness in this human life. Mm. And of course that's difficult to talk about, but you know, <laughs> I shouldn't be difficult to talk about. But it's not a kind of myth of you know, the gods coming down from heaven and walking the earth. Mm. It's, to use the poetic image that Browning uses in his wonderful poem, A Death in the Desert, it's as if a reality in this world opens out and opens out and opens out and opens out in, into infinity, into a depth. Mm. I imagine. He says it's like looking at a star in the sky. First of all, you see a point, and then you realize it's a whole world. Mm. Mm. But why do you think that the, 
the, the, the, the, the God that, that's a metaphor to, I don't mean metaphor in a sort of small way, but um, in the way that you explore, explore. Why do you think it tends to drift into this sort of very literal, binary kind of... I mean, that's too big a question, perhaps, but... but it's, it's a very fair one. Um, it does sound easier at first sight, of course, hearing. Um, and it can also, I think, give us the illusory idea that God can be manipulated as I can manipulate other mm. finite agents. Mm. You know, I can get my way with other people if I work hard enough. And if I'm very subtle and very good, I'll be able to get my way with God. Mm. Um, that's quite attractive. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Every religious system, mm. even I dare say, what is it? I mean, no, it's no, quite, yeah, do do that. <laughs> quite capable of no, no, no. going back to that sense. There must be something I can manage here. Mm. Whereas the the insights of the people one would want to listen to mm. in both our traditions and many more is look just forget about managing. You know. mm. Mm. It's sort of the leading down that sort of bartering relationship. I'll do this, yes. and uh, you'll do that. And <coughs> religion easily slips into a bartering relationship, because I suppose human beings easily slip into it. But we like being in control. Mm. Mm. And we like the sense that um, we've earned what we've got. Mm. Again, that's what I like about Herbert's poem. Mm. I love coming to meet the poet, and the poet, in fact, saying, I don't deserve to be here. Mm. And love saying, what's deserving got to do? <laughs> I'm trying to think of what I was going to say. <laughs> 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 I suddenly got off with her. Interesting. <laughs> 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 I mean, you, you were mentioning a both art tradition, and of course, you know, reading um, native words, you're very knowledgeable about Buddhism, rather worrying me. Um, <laughs> It would be nice to have something I know more about than you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wondered how, how much, or if at all, Buddhist thought and practice has influenced your own life, because you, your, your understanding of Buddhist thought isn't a casual one, and you understand what I see. You, you have quite a strong sense of what Buddhist practice might be, or at least meditation practice. It's been a very important part of my thinking and my practice too. Mm. Um, I suppose, uh, yes, a great deal of what I think of as basic practice, basic comportment, owes a lot to Buddhist friends and guides, as it does a lot to um, people of the Eastern Christian tradition. Mm. And of course those do have something to say to each other. Yes, but, um, I, there were great debt, for example, to the late John Crook mm. as a friend and teacher, who was a very remarkable Chan master. Mm. And uh, I think of him often mm. with gratitude. Mm. Mm. So I've sometimes been on retreats with a blending of Buddhist and Christian practice. Yeah, I have a friend of mine who's on a retreat with you, with John Crook. Um, I mean, coming back and sort of starting to move to the end of this discussion at least, um, I kind of want to come back to poetry and you and, and, you and poetry. Um, your poetry, you know, it is, as you, you say, it, uh, religious things matter. You don't want to think of yourself as a religious poet. There's faith throughout the collections, I felt. Um, there's a, a lot of suffering throughout the collections. Um, what can poetry do, really? I, 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 I've been thinking about this whole matter of poetry for peace, um, a few people have been talking about it. You know, with, I mean, I don't know about you, and I'm sure you'll find this, you know, when I, when I watch the news, I just find, feel, unlike my grandmother, I have to cry every time I watch the 9 o'clock news, mm -hmm. except for my, you know, my grandmother would do more than crying, you know, it just seems so terrifying, the world. Um, what really can poetry do? Is it just, um, <coughs> is it just a sort of posh exercise? Mm -hmm. um, the little class exercise. Um, it's the danger, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> consolatory art. Yeah. Um, 
Poetry makes nothing happen, mm. people say. Yeah. Um, occasionally I want to turn that round and say, well, good poetry makes nothing happen. Because mm. it makes space happen. Mm. It causes us to hesitate on the edge of something. It causes us to say, this isn't it. <coughs> and this isn't something I can <coughs> solve. This isn't something I can impose my will on. It stills. Mm. And any art that stills is doing something. And that, you know, that can be poetry, music, visual art, drama, <coughs> a wide range of things. And it can be, of course, things other than what we might call high art. But anything that has that still effect, that makes the space happen, mm. is not a waste of time because. Um, Pascal, who said that all the ills of humankind arise from the fact that no one can sit quietly with themselves a quarter of an hour in a room on their own. <laughs> um, well, there's a lot in that. Anything that <coughs> dispossesses us that little bit of the, the illusion that we can, we can sort it. But Simon Weil, once again, um, you'll gather as a favourite of mine, mm talks about hesitation as the essence of real morality. In other words, when you think you've got it sorted, and you know you can go and sort somebody else out, just stop, will you? <laughs> stop right now. <laughs> if you think you can walk into, into the Middle East and bomb the region into democracy, just you know, stop. <laughs> if you think you can solve issues around migration by building a wall, Stop. Poetry helps you stop. Mm. It's uh, it's worth the extra six months. <laughs> <laughs> and does it pass on the radiance? You talk about poetry passing on the radiance. Uh, I think it was in your interview in um, Poetry Island. Um, yes. Well, I hope so, because all this has been a bit sombre, <laughs> but also poetry is about joy, it's about the shining of things, um, and that's again part of the, the paradox and the, the mixed nature of it. Um, the greatest poets are the ones who, who tread that line where unimaginable joy and unimaginable grief are right around the edge of the words mm. all the time. Mm. Why do we go and read Shakespeare? Mm. Because with the most extraordinary economy, Shakespeare can, can hold those things together. Mm. Herbert and monosyllables, so I didn't sit and eat. Think of Shakespeare's monosyllables. Mm. Think of, oh, she's warm. Mm. The end of the winter's tale. And is there a phrase in the whole of Shakespeare's grammar? No! Yes. Or <laughs> terrifying. Yeah. But, that, yeah. but that's that's joy. Mm. But also the, the joy that's the beginning of terror, shades mm. of Rilke again. Mm. And then again, not a monosyllable, but never, 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 never in King Lear. Mm. How does he do that with these minuscule resources? Mm. As if he lays down a stone. So that's it. And he does it with extreme joy and extreme pain. But equal conviction, that's why you read it. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to finish. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>